Thank you very much for being here today, and I'd like to welcome everyone uh, in the room. It's our very, very great pleasure here at the University of Melbourne and in the Pista program at the School of Historical and Philosophical Studies to be hosting this very important conversation. Conversation uh, with Joshua Oppenheimer, who you will know for his wonderful work and his wonderful films. Um, I'm here to welcome you. My name is Kate Marion Smith, and I'm the digital chair of the history program, uh, and to welcome you to the University of Melbourne. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to elders past and present. This conversation has been organised by a number of people who have worked on Indonesian history and the pyramid history from our here in the history program. And I'd particularly like to acknowledge Dr. Jeff Melvin, Dr. Gemma Purdy, and Associate Professor Kate McGregor, because I, I just want to say that the history program here at Melbourne has had a long interest in Indonesia, and I think it's really emerging as a world leader for work done on uh, the period of 55 and uh, certainly the memory um, of those terrible events then. And I think uh, the important scholarship that we see here with our students infuses into our teaching and the way that we see uh, the world. Um, this event is supported by the Asia History Hub, the Indonesian Forum here at the University of Melbourne, and the Herb Speak Foundation. And just so that you're aware, it is being um, recorded for ABC Radio National, um, prior to cut, um, and uh, just so that you're aware of that uh, as we go. Well, it's, it is always a, a pleasure um, for a Radio National listener to <laughs> put, put a face to, to the voice that we hear. Um, and I'm very pleased that Jason Zirotto is here to take us through a conversation with Joshua. Uh, he'll be known to many of you as host of the weekly film show, The Final Cut, works on and across other RN programs, and has interviewed uh, many, many key and important people in the film industry. Uh, and Joshua uh, is uh, going to be one of those over your forensic days. So that we're on it, we're delighted. Thank you very much. There'll be a question and answer opportunity at the end that will be run uh, by Kate and Rega. We'll start. Um, we, we're in two minds about whether to... We have two sets of mics uh, today. One set is for just amplification in the room. The other set attached to our faces is for the recording. And we're wondering if... Uh, first of all, we need to use these mics at all. So if I just put this down for a moment, we have a little test run. Could you tell us in the back row if you can, if you can hear us? Um, now, if we're just talking at about this level, is that not that good? Okay, that's fine. Well, we'll, use, we'll endeavour to use the uh, hand mics in that case. And just test yours out, Joshua. This is me. <laughs> okay, yeah, I think it sounds pretty good. All right. Um, well, Josh Oppenheimer, of course, uh, will not be a stranger to any of you here tonight, uh, this afternoon. Uh, of course, director of two very powerful films about Indonesia and its uh, coming to terms with, or not coming to terms with, the legacy of the terrible uh, massacres and purges that happened in '65, the anti leftist, anti communist purges that happened at that time. Uh, and uh, we're very fortunate to have you here today uh, for this quite long uh, period, actually, an hour and a half, where we can um, talk about this process. And um, I thought I'd begin, actually, with just asking you about how you first come to Indonesia as a place that you decide you want to focus on, and, and this period in Indonesian history. Well, first of all, thank you all so much for coming, and thank you for coming down for this. And thank you for putting this together, all of you. Um, I first went to Indonesia in 2001, really not knowing anything about Indonesia. I uh, 
don't like heat. I don't like the tropics. I never had any desire to go to Indonesia. But I was asked by the International Union of Food and Agricultural Workers in Geneva if I would uh, be interested in developing my ex then very nascent exploration of nonfiction filmmaking by teaching agricultural workers somewhere in the world how to make their own film as a way of uh, documenting the struggle to organize a union, a trade union, in the aftermath of a totalitarian regime where unions had been illegal. And I could have really been sent anywhere. I was uh, under, under consideration with Colombia, uh, parts of northeastern India, which had been under martial law. In the end, I was sent to Indonesia. I found myself on a Belgian-owned oil palm plantation, the same plantation where Romley, the uh, victim at the center of the look of silence, is buried. I found myself on this Belgian plantation where the company, the Belgian company, gave the women workers the supposedly lighter job of spraying the pesticides and herbicides, but they gave them no protective clothing. And one of the herbicides was so toxic that as the mist would get into their lungs, reach their bloodstream, and then reach their livers, it would dissolve the fabric of their liver tissue. And the women were becoming ter turning yellow and dying of liver failure in their 40s. And in the six months that I was there, three women, I was two I was living with and one a relative of uh, the women I was living with died, and many more died before and after I was there. And one of the first things that they did as a union was to approach the company and ask for protective clothing. The company responded by hiring a paramilitary group called Panchasila Youth, same organization at the center of my first film, The Act of Killing, to threaten and attack the workers. The workers dropped their demands immediately, explaining to me, well, although, although this is a matter of life and death for some of us, our parents and our grandparents were part of the National Plantation Workers Union until 1965, and for that alone, although they couldn't read or write, that was seen to be uh, sufficient evidence that they would be opposed to the new military government, and they were accused of being communists as an excuse to round them up, put them in concentration camps, and kill them. And we are afraid, they explain, that this could still happen again, because uh, not only are the perpetrators still in power, uh, but that this organization, Pantasila Youth, was the main civilian paramilitary group to kill with the army in this region. With, this is how I came across the 1965 genocide for the first time. And more importantly, more to the point, what I came across was the present day fear that uh, was actually not to, that was killing my friends. You see, I realized right away what was killing my friends was not only poison, but also fear. It's interesting that, um, I mean, the two films are very much a vision pair in a sense, because the first film, and, and it's clear why the first film does focus on the perpetrators, because they do live with impunity in Argentina, and the first film, the act of killing. Indonesia. Oh, we were just Indonesia. talking about Oh my goodness. I have a personal link to Argentina, which has a similar <laughs> parallel history, and sometimes that comes out. <laughs> I was forewarned. It's happened three times today. I won't do it again. Um, I think it's interesting and insightful. I mean, truly insightful. Mm. A bit disturbing, but anyway. Uh, this, this is very interesting that because they live with impunity, you were able to capture them talking very openly about what they did, and you know, part of the bizarre, surreal wonder of that film is the reenactments that, they're, that they do for you on camera, and you know, it gets to the point where they're actually also uh, making films, uh, sort of genre films, and reenacting you know, their various exploits, uh, and creating alter egos and so forth. So with complete sort of a lack of any sort of guilt or any sort of sense of remorse, your second film in this pair then becomes a focus on a descendant of one of the victims, whose older brother Ramley was killed, uh, was born after the purges, but you accompany him on a journey to find remorse from these people. And it's this, if you're looking for remorse in the film, it's quite a frustrating film because I mean, that's the point. He doesn't really find it, except maybe find the shadow of it on a couple of occasions. But tell me about how the two films in terms of your process, um, link up. Did you make them at the same time? How, how, how did they link up? 
Well, well first I'd like to say that um, that I think that what you don't find are public acknowledgments of remorse. But I think that what the act of killing is about and what uh, led me to spend when I met Anwar Congo, who was the 41st perpetrator I filmed, I met him in early to uh, mid, mid 2005 after I'd been filming perpetrators for two years, what led me to linger on him and spend five years filming with him and the men around him was my realization through him uh, that the boasting is itself a symptom of guilt. That uh, the very first, the, if you think of the act of killing, if you've seen the act of killing, one of the very first scenes in the film, if, and indeed it was the very first day I met on him, he took me to a rooftop and uh, showed me how he killed, and then said, I now have to show you how the victims died. And that's not, you don't see him, dem you don't see him demonstrating uh, the role of the victims. It cut, cut beyond that. But then you see him say, if I think about this, I will go crazy. And I, to, forget, to protect myself from that, I've spent the last, my whole life, going out drinking, taking drugs, dancing, and look, I'm a good dancer. And he dances in the spot where he's killed perhaps a thousand people, hundreds of people, and he has a length of wire around his own neck because he's just finished showing me how he killed. And it's as though he's trying to banish the pain that just came up through the boasting, and the, and the uh, sorry, through the demonstration. And the, the dancing is a kind of boasting, it's a kind of uh, insistence that it's at least a kind of denial of the moral meaning of what he's done, to dance where you've killed all these people. And I suddenly realized we'd be boasting to chase away doubt, which we all know. I mean, I'm sure every single one of you here boasts from time to time, even if it's not something we're proud of. And you know when you boast, you never boast because you really feel proud. You always boast because uh, you feel actually, because you feel small. We, we are like birds who puff out our feathers to look bigger because we know we're small. So I had this sense that boasting and uh, guilt might be two sides of the same coin. And I spent five years filming with Anwar and the men around him to explore that. And what I, Adi doesn't get in the look of silence is anybody who has the courage to, in a present, focused, uh, sincere way, acknowledge guilt. It's not so surprising when you think that at the end of five years of filming with Anwar Congo, he's retching over his guilt. But he's still saying in between bouts of retching, my conscience told me they had to be killed. That is to say, even then, he can't get himself to admit what he did was wrong to himself. So I think that it's, I think we can't expect, and this, this speaks, I'm sure, areas we'll go in this conversation later about the aim of truth, reconciliation, and the purpose of justice. We can't expect perpetrators to sort of, of their own accord, acknowledge what they've done is wrong because it's too threatening. Uh, it's too emotionally threatening. Now, Going, answering your question about the production of the film, uh, I started, as I said, on this plantation where, I, where Romley was buried. And Romley had become, as a name, synonymous with the genocide as a whole. Because across uh, that region, North Sumatra, very, very few uh, murders had witnesses. And Romley's was one of them. Tens of thousands of people had been brought to rivers like Sungai Ular, the Snake River, nearby, where you see, which you see in the Look of Silence. Tens of thousands of people had been brought to rivers, killed, and their families never told what happened, like the disappeared in Argentina, which meant that the uh, relatives of the dead couldn't really talk about what happened. They couldn't work through their grief. They couldn't mourn. Not only were the dead unburied, but they were unmourned, because uh, survivors couldn't bring themselves to say their loved ones had died. They could only say, they hadn't come home yet. Uh, because out of deference to the ever uh, ever diminishing but never quite vanishing possibility that they might one day come home, they could, however, talk about Romney. And to speak about Romney was to give voice, give expression to some of this grief that they couldn't speak about in their own lives. And so gradually he had become a synonym, the name had become synonymous with the genocide. And it was inevitable, therefore, when uh, the survivors said to me after making the that film about their struggle to organize a union, they said, come back, and this time you make a film about why we're still afraid, 40 years on. At that time, it was even less than 40 years on. They said, come back, and you make a film. I went back immediately and inevitably right away was introduced to Adi's parents, 
they wanted me to meet Adi because they said they were going crazy in 1966, 1967, or Rohani, Adi's mother said this. And she said, you must meet my son Adi. I was able to continue living because I had him. He looks like Romley, talks like Romley, acts like Romley. He is like a reincarnation of Romley. And she called him to the village. And that's how I met Adi. Adi was not traumatized in the same way as the rest of his family because he hadn't experienced the killings firsthand. And he was desperate to understand what had happened. He knew the story of his brother's murder, which his mother would repeat morning, noon, and night. It was like an echo that would never fade from her consciousness. And yet he didn't know at all. And, and he knew the government propaganda. You see, uh, you see, he, he'd seen the, this film in, in junior high school. This film, this propaganda film, came out, which depicts uh, it depicts communists. The bad people they were, really. Yeah, you see it in the complete version of The Act of Killing, which is what came out in Australia. And you see, it's essentially, if you haven't seen The Act of Killing, but have only seen The Look of Silence, it's a kind of graphic depiction, almost like a horror movie, a slasher movie depiction of what's being taught to Adi's son in school in The Look of Silence. So he knew this lie that had no relationship to his family's suffering and experience, and he knew the details of his brother's death, but he didn't even know that every home in his neighborhood, his village, had lost anywhere between one and three people. He would play with children uh, in, the, in the neighborhood, not knowing that their older brothers, their parents, their aunts, their uncles had been killed. And he latched onto my filmmaking as this way of trying to understand what had everybody lost that had made everybody so afraid. What, and in a sense, he was trying to find himself through my film. So he approached. You or was it clear early on that he, you know, he wanted to be part of this he process? He just had this incredible energy. I think he said, uh, two, he said uh, two days ago at this talk we did at the Wheeler Center, he said he was on Skype, and he said, he actually apologized to me, it was a little bit humorous, where he said, I'm sorry for using you to make this film. Um, and, but he really, he just grabbed a hold of it. And he, you know, he said, I, I said, so what would be the way to start? And he, he just... In a meeting with Adi and his family, and he just, I'll get you survivors. I'll bring people who can talk. And he would bring people on his bicycle, the same way you see him bringing his mother in the film to the grave. He never had brakes on his bicycle, which always alarmed me. He brakes with his foot on the front wheel. It's something you, as some of you may have noticed in the look of silence. He would bring these survivors to tell me their stories, and this is all in early 2003, and they would come already on the bicycle crying. Mm. Not because of their memories were so painful, but at the emotion that comes with breaking, uh, speaking for the first time about what happened. But uh, it's interesting to note he's he's early forties, Adi, so he's not uh, a very young man who you know he's been around the block a couple of times in life. He knows you would think he has a sense of what he's getting into when he's committing to something, and yet he's not a filmmaker, and and you know you know very well. Um, that the road he was about to take with you was going to be a very fraught one. Did, did he have a sense of how fraught it would be, how how it would be putting himself in danger? Did you, and, and did you have to coach him? How much did you well, have to brief him? Well, I'll, I'll come to that. But it's an important question, but I'm still all the way back in 2003 here. So he, he would bring survive, and I think at the beginning we didn't know how dangerous this would be at all. Uh, he started to bring survivors. For three weeks, I recorded stories from survivors that Adi introduced me to. And then the army came and visited them one by one, threatening them not to participate in the film. You see, the Indonesian army is deployed like an octopus into every village. This, this was done with American aid and American advice back in the late 50s, early 60s. It's deployed like an octopus with offices in every village, useless for national defense, but uh, perfect for internal repression. And uh, so they knew what was happening. They were, the survivors were under surveillance and were threatened not to participate. Adi then called me with some of the survivors to a midnight meeting in his parents' home and said, OK, if, you, if we can't be in the film, please don't give up and go home. Try to film the perpetrators, which I was afraid to do at first. I overcame that fear. I approached them. I encountered that I discovered that it took nothing to get them to open up. They were open and boastful. And Whereas uh, we were always looking over our shoulders when I was filming with the survivors, when I was filming with the perpetrators, 
that it was like the authorities were rolling out a red carpet for everything we were doing. If we wanted to, if a perpetrator would bring me to a spot to demonstrate how they killed, they, uh, they would go to the local police office and ask them to block off the road. Because they are, and you should point out for those who maybe haven't seen one, one of the films or maybe even I haven't seen both of them. I mean, they're regarded as heroes. Oh, they're officially by, by, the, by the state. They've been, yes. regarded by, they've been regarded as heroes. So I spent, I, after I feel, encountered this, I, I showed the, this material back to Adi, who asked to see it. Of course, he sent me to shoot it. And seeing it, Adi and then the other survivors who wanted to see it, and then the broader Indonesian human rights community who started seeing clips would say, you must continue to film the perpetrators. You're onto something terribly important because anyone who hears the way these uh, executioners, specifically the lower-ranking executioners, for whatever reason, have this need to boast about the most unseemly details about what they've done. Anyone who hears that will recognize that the claim that this was heroic must be a lie. So film the perpetrators and expose the terrible present-day impunity, which is the real subject of my two films. It's not about what happened in 1965. I'm not a historian, and these are not historical documentaries. These are films about impunity today. I was then I, I then felt entrusted by the survivors, by the human rights community, to do this work that clearly they couldn't do themselves safely which was to film the perpetrators, I stopped feeling like a foreigner who was making a film for a foreign audience and much more like an agent, kind of secret agent of the human rights community and the, and the survivors in Indonesia. And I spent the next two years filming every perpetrator I could find. And in The Look of Silence, the footage Adi's watching comes from that two-year period. Anwar Congo was the 41st perpetrator I filmed. As I said, that was at the end of that two-year period. Over the next five years, Adi would continue to watch everything I really had time to show him. When I finished shooting The Look of Silence, when I finished shooting The Look of Silence, sorry, the yeah. I'm just hearing some kind of strange <laughs> rumbling. <laughs> um, when I finished shooting The Act of Killing in 2010, I gave Adi a small camera to look. I'll say one more thing. In, there, there's a scene in The Look of Silence where two men take me down to a river, taking turns playing victim and perpetrator. I filmed that eight months into that first two-year period, in January 2004. And it was the first time that I ever dared to bring two perpetrators together, because I knew it could be risky. I knew one might tell another. I didn't know how they would react to hearing the other speaking in this way. And so I'd always film people alone. But at some point, I had to know, were they boasting only for me? Was it something about my camera, my foreignness, my manner that was eliciting this boasting? Or would they speak with each other in the same way? Eventually, I took the risk. I brought these two men together and found, of course, that they were even worse, that they were reading from a shared script, that they were trying to outdo one another. And that was a very important moment for me. I had to relinquish the hope that these men, the self-gratifying hope that these men might be monsters or that they might be psychopath, psychopathic. And I had to recognize that whatever insanity or monstrosity is here is political and collective. And the way that thought occurred to me, there's a moment in that, can I just ask, how many of you have seen The Look of Silence? Which of you, so quite, quite a few of you. And the rest who haven't should see it tomorrow. <laughs> I, I, I'd like to paint a picture for those, if I can, I'd paint a picture for those who haven't. Like, by the way, these two men go down by River Bank, where the killing happened. 50 years ago, they actually did the killing, and they're pretty much acting out how they would slice and chop and kill these people. Yeah, they're, they're uh, almost falling over one another to sort of tell, to show how they killed, uh, taking turns playing victim and perpetrator. They lead me to a spot where one, uh, one uh, document that I found at the National Security Archive in Washington, D.C., said 10,500 people had been killed at this one little clearing. And I, uh, filming that, and then when they reach the river, they reveal, one of them reveals that he was the man who killed Ramli, Adi's brother, something I didn't know when I was filming that. But I was already very close to Adi and his family, so it, it, I, it, I did a kind of double take when I heard that. Anyways, in between bouts of boasting, they, they come to this sort of grassy embankment, which is a little bit slippery, and they're helping each other down this slope in a gentle way. They're sort of holding hands and helping each other down. They're older. They're frail old men. Yeah, they're in their 70s. And one of them 
And, and while I was watching them, it occurred to me for the first time, something that I've said many times since because it really stuck with me. My God, it's as though I've wandered into Germany 40 years after the Holocaust, only to find the Nazis still in power if the rest of the world, the United States, Australia, the UK, Japan, had celebrated the Holocaust while it took place, which accounts for this shamelessness. And that evening I went home and noted in my diary, I realized two things. I realized that this atrocity in Indonesia is not unique, that it's in fact one of the lesser known of many atrocities across the global south, including uh, the ones in Argentina, which you were thinking about earlier. Um, and that the production of oil palm, which was kit, which kills the women who have to spray, who, pr who produce it for us, is also not unique. That everything we buy from the global south is produced through a kind of through, through gross exploitation, and we profit from this, at least financially, if not spiritually. And realizing this, I thought maybe this idea, what if the Nazis had won, is not the exception to the rule. It's not this unique. Uh, situation, there were this surreal scenario from science fiction, maybe it is the rule across most of the global south, and maybe this kind of impunity is really the story of our times. And realizing that, I decided I would stop everything I was doing and spend as many years as it would take to address this situation. And I realized I would make two films, one about the lies, the fantasies, the stories the perpetrators tell so that they can live with themselves, the persona they inhabit so they can live with themselves. The film really analyzing the boastful bravado of the perpetrators, and then the terrible effects of those lies when imposed on the whole society. And a second film about what is it like for survivors to have to live in such a society? What did it do to human beings to have to live for 50 years afraid? And I, after shooting the act of killing, I gave, as I mentioned, Adi a small camera to look for images that might inspire making the second film. This is now in 2010. He, I went home to edit, he would send me tapes. And when I returned in early 2012 to make The Look of Silence, it was after editing The Act of Killing, but before it had its first screenings, at which point I knew I couldn't safely return to Indonesia. I met Adi and didn't know he would be the main character. I only knew he would be a main collaborator in working with the survivors and their story. And Adi said, you know, I've spent seven years looking at your footage of the perpetrators. It's changed me. I need to meet them. I need to see if they can take responsibility for what they've done. And I said immediately, reflexively, no. Absolutely not. It's too dangerous. There has never before been a film where survivors confront perpetrators who are still in power, and for good reason because it's too dangerous. And Adi then took out the camera that I'd given him and took out a tape and said, I'm sorry I never sent you this tape, but it's very personal to me. And trembling, he put the tape in the camera, pressed play, and, and as soon as the image from that tape, from what he'd shot, appeared on the flip screen of the camera, Adi started to cry. And he showed me the one scene in the look of silence that Adi shot. And it's a scene at the very end where his father is crawling through his own home, lost, calling for help. And Adi said, you see, this is the first day my father couldn't remember anyone in our family. And we, he was confused and calling for help all day, and we couldn't help him because when we would try, he's nearly deaf, nearly blind. We would have to like touch him to make him realize we were there, and he would panic, thinking we were strangers coming to hurt, coming to hurt him. And he said... He said, my father has forgotten the son whose murder. He said, he said that, sorry, he said it was unbearable to have his father crawling through the house and not being able to help him. And at some point, not knowing what else to do, wanting to be close, not being able to sit next to him and do nothing, he picked up the camera to film to sort of protect himself from what was happening. And then he said the moment he started filming, he understood that he was witnessing and documenting the day that it became too late for Adi's father to heal. Because he can't remember the son whose murder destroyed the family, destroyed his life, but he hadn't forgotten the fear. And now he can't, he'll never work through the fear because he can't remember what happened. So he'll die like in a prison of fear, like a man who's locked in a room who can't even find the door, let alone the key. We watch the scene play out. And at the, end of, at the end, he looked at me and he said, you see, I don't want my children to inherit this prison of fear from my father and from my mother and from me. 
And then he said, and I think if I can visit the perpetrators and show that I'm not there looking for revenge, I'm not there out of anger, they will welcome this as a chance to stop their manic boasting and be forgiven by their victim's family, and they will apologize. They'll take responsibility and then I and apologize, and I will be able to forgive them. And then my children will need not be afraid of their neighbors anymore and can grow up without fear. And I was moved. I went home. I talked to my Indonesian crew. And they said, Joshua, you see, the production of the act of killing in North Sumatra, the shooting of it, was well known. If you've seen the act of killing, Indonesian state television, TVRI, produced a talk show in North Sumatra celebrating the production of the film while we were shooting it. It was a big story because it was well known that I was working with some of the most powerful men in the country. Yusuf Kalat, who's again vice president and was then, Yato Suryo Sumarno, the head, national head of the paramilitary movement, Pachasila Youth, members of parliament, ministers in the cabinet, the governor of the province, and some very well-known notorious perpetrators too. It was This was well-known. And because nobody had seen the film yet, I was still seen to be, believed to be close to these men. And so, of course, I'm still close to Anwar Congo, but all of these high-ranking politicians hate me, as they ought to, as I would, I suppose that if they didn't, I, there would be something wrong with my own work. Um, but because that wasn't the case then, because people hadn't seen the film yet, the men Adi wants to confront, my crew pointed out, are regionally but not nationally powerful. And they will not dare even detain you, let alone physically attack you, because they don't want to offend their superiors whom they believe you're still close to. So this very surreal, unique situation of having made the act of killing but not having screened it is what would allow us to do these confrontations safely. I told Adi, OK, maybe we can do this safely. We have to be prepared to stop at any point. We have to tell your family what we're doing as soon as there's before there's any real danger, and they have to understand it and agree. And if they don't, we have to stop. And then we have to be prepared not to release the film if we can't find a way of releasing it safe in a safe way for your family and that the family's comfortable with. And I also said, and I don't think we'll get that apology you're hoping for. I said I think that I'll, at the very best, I will. Um, we will. I explained that we didn't ever get there with Anwar Congo, as I mentioned earlier. And I said, at the best, we'll be able, the best we can hope for, I think, is that I will be able to film with precision and intimacy and focus and empathy, even why we fail. The panic, the denial, the, 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 the threats, the new, that, that will, are inevitable when you go into someone's home and say, look, you've been living in denial of this for or of the moral meaning of this for your whole life, but you've killed my brother, can you take responsibility? If I can film why we fail, then we can make visible this previously invisible abyss of fear and guilt dividing everybody. We can show how torn uh, the fabric of Indonesian society is and how urgently truth, reconciliation, and justice are needed. And in that sense, through the film as a whole, maybe we'll succeed in a bigger way where we fail in individual confrontations. There's a moment where uh, Adi's wife, though, does confront him and says, I, I wasn't really aware of the extent to which this film, that, that this process was going, that you were confronting these people who live amongst us, you know, and are very powerful. Um, do you not think you have a daughter? You know, why are you putting yourself in danger and why are you potentially putting the rest of us in danger? Clearly, there was, he, he had communicated the full extent of the project to her. How was that situation? And, and well, it's a little bit it's a little bit out of sequence in the film in order to make you feel and understand when it comes in the film you've already seen Adi threatened a couple times and you that's important so that you can feel the risk that she's responding to that she understands but in reality uh, the, we shot one confrontation with Eno the man who sort of the, uh, with the red glasses who's sort of the key the opening shot in the film. We shot that confrontation first. I mean, when you're making a film, it's sort of a broader point. You think, uh, you, don't, you don't have a sense of this is the film I want to make, and I'm going to do whatever's necessary to make this film. You take a step by step as you would if you were climbing a mountain where the slope is slippery and you're trying to find the safe route up to the top. And you don't, but you can't even see the top. You don't quite know where you're going. So 
Uh, if you think of it like that, that, that's maybe a better framework for thinking about how we shot the film. So we, what we did to, to make sure we were as safe as possible was we chose one confrontation that we could shoot at really no risk to anybody, and that was the confrontation with Eno. We knew Eno for several reasons. First, we knew he, that he was a dead squad leader of the village. He was, yeah, he was a villain, an executioner yeah. in the village, and a leader of this very small village of dead squad. But he wasn't. He was very low ranking. Yes. He lived in a remote location, and we knew that he had such an uh, arrogant sort of personality that uh, I, I knew this that all of his superiors and commanders hated him and saw him as a liar. So we knew that it was very unlikely he would have anyone to complain to if afterwards. And we also told you know, if you remember the film, Adi doesn't tell Enon you know, that it, he's Romney's brother. No. So um, or that he's related to the survivors at all. He just confronts him on the lies that you know, he's telling to justify what he's done. And is this one of the moments in the film where he, I think it's him, his, um, this person who says, um, your questions go much deeper than Joshua's. Yeah, that's, he's, he's the one who says this. He's a much kind of sharper, he, not sharper, but his, his questions go deeper and cut closer to the bottom, I guess, which is what you said. Yeah, I mean, it's important to realize that when I, I mean, I think that in the act of killing with men like Adi Zulkatri, when I say, look, you've committed war crimes against humanity, what if you were brought to The Hague? And he said, well, he was, and a moment later in that scene, he says, look, I know uh, what you're finding out, Joshua, is true, but it's not good. And I said, yes, but for the millions of victims' families, if the truth comes out, it is good. So I think that I did ask quite confronting questions in the act of killing, but it with wasn't Eno, a no, 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 I didn't take it that way. But it's, but it's easy. No, no, don't worry. I didn't yeah. take it that way. But it's, it's, it's a kind of understandable misunderstanding to think that okay, the reason that these men are so open in the act of killing and the boasting goes on for as long and becomes as elaborate as it does and transforms into these genre-inspired dramatizations is somehow because I was holding back. On the contrary, once Anwar opened up about his nightmares, I was able to open up about my own feelings too and tell him I was having nightmares and that I, it was pretty horrible the things he was describing. Uh, the fact is, though, with Enon, with the men that Adi's confronting, if you remember, I said I met them. These are people I filmed in this first two year period when I was filming everybody I could find. And I was working my way up the chain of command and still trying to understand what had happened, where it happened, how it happened. And indeed, I was not confronting people because I was. Did not wanting things to stop as they would have, as they did when Adi confronted them before we'd even begun. But Adi is, of course, a very, very sharp and brilliant, uh, brilliant. Uh, Questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I hesitate over the word. Why reason. was he so good, though? Was it just innate because of his family background and the emotions he had within him? Did you did you coach yeah. him at all? I mean, he's a very good interviewer. Well, yeah, I, I hesitate. I was stumbling here because I hesitate to say that it's an interview at all, right? An interview is something you do when you're, you're sort of interviewing me. An interview is something you do when you're trying to find out information. Adi knows what these men have done. He's trying to do something. He's trying to achieve something through the com these confrontations. He's trying to get them to acknowledge what he believes they already know, which is that it's wrong. And he does it by looking at them in a kind of a humanizing gaze with this unflinching, gentle, but also honest gaze, saying, look, you're humans. If you can just admit what you've done is wrong, I can forgive you. I can separate your humanity from uh, your crime, and I can forgive you as a human being. And uh, that doesn't make it, you would think maybe at first that that would make it easier for them, because they have forgiveness within their, within their reach. But but it doesn't. I think it makes it much harder. I had to feel this sort of thought for the first time consciously when I was hearing survivors of the shooting at the African American church in Charleston, South Carolina. I heard survivors forgiving on the radio the perpetrator of that crime. And I thought, oh, my God, this makes it so much harder because the perpetrator now has to see his victims as human. And I think the same thing happens here. They, they have to look back at Adi's face they're being seen as human, so they have to see him as human. The face kind of has this, uh, the ph philosopher Levinas talks about it, the face has this kind of moral, makes this kind of moral demand on us. And they look back at him and they're forced to see him as human, therefore they're forced to see Romley as a human being, and by extension all of their victims as human beings. And, what they're, and, and in this mirror in which they then see therefore their own humanity, I think they, are, they confront their conscience and they panic. They're not afraid of him, they're afraid of their own guilt. So what I think it's 
Adi is focused very single-mindedly on achieving this this confrontation. So of course he asks the most confronting and pertinent question, and he's very, I mean, he's a brilliant man, Adi, too. I, I just think, to, I was in the middle of this about Enong and the theme of Adi's wife, I don't want to forget that, yes. it's important. So with Enong, that was a kind of test. We knew it didn't pose us any danger. Adi didn't reveal who he was. We then went back and Adi told his mother and his wife what he was doing. They respond, as you see in the film. Then we got together and screened for them the footage from the scene with Eno, that they, well, this is what these confrontations look like, this is what Adi's trying to do, so they could see what it was that he meant, that he's not coming out of revenge. And then they asked, they were very moved by that. I mean, they were very moved. It was suddenly, they saw, although there might be risk, they saw that like this, uh, this gulf of silence is being bridged, at least Adi's trying to bridge it. And they, we taught, they said, is there, what can we do if, if, we want, if Adi wanted to continue, and we see why he wants to continue, can it be done safely? And then we started planning how to do it safely, which included having the family at the airport ready to evacuate if there was any uh, risk, if there were, anything went wrong, having a getaway car for Adi so that the moment we were done shooting, he was bundled out into a car uh, with, two, frankly, two preman, two thugs who were not on the side of the perpetrators, who just bodyguards who hustled him into the car to get him out of there, having him with no ID so that if we were detained, they couldn't figure out who he was by the time we got help from our embassies, and various other things, not using an Indonesian crew. Um, and so, uh, and, then, and then also agreeing that we wouldn't release the film until the family, until we made a comprehensive plan for how to do so safely that the family was comfortable with. So that was how, that came about. Did he know? I mean, subsequently, um, I, I understand what's happened is that the family has relocated. So some of those plans, and the film has released in Argentina, unlike, I mean, oh my goodness. That's <laughs> great. Keep it up. You're making, he's making a really important historical and political point every time he does it. <laughs> Just for purposes of the edit. Um, and the film was released in Indonesia, and it did very well at the box office. Not at the box office. It's banned from commercial cinema distribution. Oh, okay. 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 Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Just for the edit. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, I was under the impression I knew a lot of people saw the act of killing. No, more, more people have seen the look of silence, but it yeah, hasn't so been distributed commercially. I see. I see. It's been. Yeah. It's with the yeah. National Human Rights Commission, a government body, yeah. and the Jakarta Art Council, it's a quasi-government body. Has distributed the, they're the official distributors of the film. They've built on the network of community, NGO, film club, and university screenings that released The Act of Killing to, and expanded upon it to uh, make sure that the film's been very widely screened. It's screened over 3,500 times in Indonesia. The first screening was in the largest theater in Indonesia. There were billboards around Jakarta announcing the screening. People, twice the capacity of the, screen, of the theater turned up. Thousands of people came. They put on two screenings. Adi came to both and received. Maybe he only came. I was just corrected. I think he only came to the second of the two screenings for his safety, or the first. I don't remember. Was anyone there? No. It, it, he came to one of them. I was. I thought he was at both, but it was for safety reasons. He came to one and didn't return, so that in case there was danger, came to one and received a 15-minute standing ovation. And the film then came out a month later with 500 public simultaneous screenings. On the first day, and then came out the other. So it's screened widely, but not commercially. Right. Um, and he's become, at a certain point, there was a hashtag around him, so, and which you might like to describe. Yes, it, like, it, Indonesia is the most. Um, the day, yeah, that, that's right. the most Twitter users in the world, apparently. Yeah, the day that the film, that the film had its Indonesian premiere was the 10th of November, and that day was chosen because it's one month before the 10th of December when the film would come out around the country. And the 10th of December is International Human Rights Day. On the 10th of November, though, for those of you who are Indonesian here and uh, know the dates of stupid holidays, it's National Heroes Day. And I say it's a stupid holiday because I strongly, uh, I, I, I reiterated every point I can. Yeah. I reiter reiterated every point I can that my, my uh, conviction that Oscar Wilde was right when he said that patriotism is the virtue of the vicious. So uh, the 10th of November, though, being National Heroes Day, Adi presented the film in Jakarta at this, 
enormous screening, and uh, 1,500 people the screening, um, and trending on Twitter in Indonesia and consequently around the world, because Indonesia is the largest Twitter-using country in the world, was today we have a new national hero, and his name is Adi Rukun. So that, that's what you were referring to. I want to ask you a little bit about this concept of the shadow state that I, I know that you speak of, and it's an important concept to understand when we try and imagine how this impunity, how this culture of impunity is ongoing in Argentina, and how perhaps prospect. Oh. <laughs> no need to correct. <laughs> How this uh, oh, <laughs> embarrassing. Anyway, it's, it's um, <laughs> how this culture of impunity has managed to is ongoing in Indonesia, and how um, how prospects for yeah well, one, one national thing. reconciliation. Sorry, how prospects for national reconciliation don't look good, do they? Well, I think there. I think that there. I think it's. I think they're mixed. I mean, I think that the silence depended on people not, prospects are mixed. I mean, I think the silence depended on the public and the media accepting lies that what happened was heroic. And that's changed and is changing quickly, in part as a result of these two films. And yet the release of the look of silence, this wide release by two government bodies, uh, that led to a backlash from another part of the state, which operates with impunity, and that's the military hiring thugs to threaten to attack screening, and then using that as a basis to demand that screenings be canceled, saying we can't protect uh, your safety, we can't guarantee your safety, so you have to cancel the screenings. Nonsense, of course, since it was, the, this, it was the military that hired the thugs to threaten the screenings in the first place. So uh, what this is, and then also, so what's been revealed in the sort of official embrace of the film by part of the state and the uh, illegal attacks on the film by another part of the state is this the fact that the state is not a uni unified body and that there is in fact a shadow state around the Indonesian military which uh, has I think as its bedrock the fact that the Indonesian military is formally above the law. It's worth really stressing that because most people will think, well, the military sort of military rule ended in 1998, and there's no longer reserved seats in the parliament for military. But you don't have a democracy unless you have rule of law. But it doesn't matter whether there's elected bodies that make laws if the laws don't apply. And the Indonesian military uh, can, a military general in Indonesia can order the massacre of everyone in this room or everyone in a village or everyone in a city, and they cannot be put on trial in civil, civilian court. That's worth thinking about. That's shocking to non-Indonesian ears. They could be punished in two ways. The parliament could convene a human rights court, an ad hoc special human rights court. The government could, con uh, the parliament could convene a human rights court. That has never happened, not for a single atrocity committed in 1965 or since, because the members of parliament, even if they're no longer, uh, they're no longer reserved seats for army officers, the members of parliament are, uh, dominant, are, are not, perhaps even for the most part, oligarchs who are able to use their wealth to buy their seats, fundamentally. And, they're all, and they owe their wealth to their connivance, their collaboration uh, with the military dictatorship. And in that sense, their wealth is criminal, and they don't want that exposed by exposing atrocities. So never has a human rights, sorry, never has a human rights court been convened by the Indonesian uh, parliament. And, and it won't be until Indonesia is no longer an oligarchy and becomes genuinely democracy. And, Similarly, and I don't say this with just finger wagging, I mean, the United States is probably more of an oligarchy than a democracy, too. Um, but similarly, and, and similarly, the only other way the Indonesian army, army commander could be put on trial for massacring an entire village is if the military itself chose to convene a military tribunal, which means, which they won't do if the massacre 
was part of the what was the, the policy of the was, the was something that the army wanted to achieve. They might uh, they might go after the soldiers who were following orders or the paramilitaries who were following orders, but they won't go after the commanders, which means that the military is formally above the law, and that means they can uh, deploy paramilitaries and thugs and gangsters with impunity to do, to do their dirty work. And you see in the in the act of killing, you see the present day vice president of Indonesia, Yusuf Kala, addressing uh, a, a conference, a convention of Pantasila youth paramilitaries, all wearing orange camouflage. And he said, effectively, we need our gangsters to be able to beat people up and get things done. Get things done. That's what you can do with a shadow state. And that's what he's appealing to. And it's tempting to feel like, well, to ask, we, we could ask, well, it's, it's tempting to ask, how could Yusuf Kala be uh, chosen by Joko, Joko Widodo, the current president, as, as his running mate. How could such a man, whose greatest moment of international, not, if not glory, then notoriety, comes from saying that he needs gangsters to be able to get things done? How could he be re-elected? How could he be elected again as vice president? I think the answer to that is that this is not a problem with Yusuf Kala. This is a systemic problem. This is a structural problem, an institutional problem, and Indonesians ultimately know that. They know that whoever addressed that mob, that mob on that day would have to pander to them and would say something similar. In fact, we were disappointed when Yusuf Kala turned up and did that because it was supposed to be Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono who was scheduled to come and make that speech, the president of Indonesia. And something came up at the last minute, he canceled and he sent his vice president. So there's nothing particularly rotten about Yusuf Kala, although he was an apologist for the genocide in 1966, presumably, as he's a member of the Akatan 66, the generation of intellectuals who supported and sometimes participated in the killings. But he, uh, the, the big problem is this structural thing where the military has legal immunity. And I don't think you can have a democracy until that changes. Let me now just ask a final question before throwing questions over to the audience. And that is um, something that I know a lot of people in the room will be interested in, and that is you have hours and hours of footage. You've made two films. I know you don't think there's a third to be made, but what are you doing with the footage in terms of archiving you know, the public record and so forth? Well, we're just working with the Danish Film Institute to make sure that the archive is preserved and in some ways accessible. There's all sorts of ethical conundrums about how to make it accessible to researchers because uh, many of the people in the, in the archive are not in the films. and are talking, it's, are ta I think it's the world's largest audiovisual archive pertaining to the genocide, although it's very specific in its focus on North Sumatra, um, just because there's so much, because I'm such an undisciplined filmmaker. There's 1,200 hours of material from the act of killing, and another, I don't know, I never counted how much from the Lucas Islands, but it's much less. Anyways, uh, there are issues about how you make it accessible because people are still alive, their families are still alive, we don't have a team in place to protect people's families and to, to monitor their safety uh, if people start writing and exposing uh, talk. So there may be some need to anonymize parts of that archive as a condition of access, but we are working on how to make the archive available to scholars in whatever way, you know, in whatever way we can. We do, uh, so we have a roving mic, um, and I'd ask you to raise your hands, raise your hands up high so we can just see who does have a question. And uh, if you could wait until the mic gets to you, uh, just the gentleman in front there. I just wanted to ask. Uh, just uh, checking the mic there. Hold on, just keep the sound in That's okay. Yeah. I just wanted to ask um, in the act of killing where Anwar Congo. Uh, has the two his two grandsons on his knee where they're watching him play the role of victim, um, and they go back. I think they go back to bed, and he gets quite upset. Do you think that that was genuine remorse, or do you think that it was definitely wasn't an act? Do you think that would have been generated apart from the camera being there or not? I just want to check if people up the back heard it because of course this is a recording mic, not a PA mic. Did you hear that question? Yeah, is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's tricky because the whole situation wouldn't have happened without cameras, right? I mean, Anwar is making these scenes for my film, 
right? The, 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 the film noir scene where he's playing the victim. He's made that for the act of killing, and he uh, would never be watching it or having that sort of encounter with himself, and with this, uh, if, if it were not for the film. I think that uh, he brings the children along as a kind of human shield so that he can say, so that uh, he can find reassurance that it's not existentially, fundamentally devastating by uh, somehow reassuring himself that his grandchildren can watch this too and, and they will be they're okay, so it's okay, so he's okay. And then when they get and I, when they get bored and go back to bed, he's suddenly left vulnerable and, and, and naked and defenseless. And then he, and I think he, he starts to get very upset. And then he throws up one more kind of, uh, I think, shield, one more attempt to protect himself. And that's in this kind of statement where he says, I now feel what my victims feel. Uh, hoping that if I say yes, it's like he'll, it's it's like a priest delivering, you know, saying sort of absolving somebody of their sins. And I just, whenever I'm filming, I try to be very very present in the moment with the person, feeling what they want from me, but also feeling what's true, and always to answer where or whenever I can with what's true. And I, I obviously he wasn't feeling what his victims felt because they were dying and he's acting. And I said that to him, and then I think. The, sort of it's like pulling the bottom out from him, and he's gazing down into the abyss, into the, into the, into the abyss of beneath him. It's like, like a man who's run. I sort of think of the boasting, the performance, the talking, the endless desires to her, desire to tell what's happened, and insist that it's okay. Is a little bit like do you have in Australia ever or in Indonesia? Because there's quite a lot of Indonesians here. Roadrunner and Coyote. I'm sure you had it in Indonesia because you're so like, terribly dominated by American cultural shit. Although it's pretty good, that stuff. Um, it's good shit. But the, I feel like the, the, I feel like the, the, the somehow, they, they're, I feel like that the boasting of the perpetrator, the bo I feel like in that moment it's like he's like the coyote when he looks down and sees that he's already off the edge of the cliff. And, and, and it's this moment, this terrible moment for him. It's not the same as what his victims went through, but it's also terrible. I mean, what his victims went through, I don't even say, what, I don't say that was worse. I mean, I don't know if I'd rather live the rest of my life seeing what Anwar sees when he's forced to look down there, or as Anwar, whether I'd rather have that or whether I'd rather be a victim who, who, who killed. I don't know. Um, I think that I think it speaks to something about the boasting in general and why I focused on the uh, executioners as opposed to the commanders. There are commanders in both my films, and you hear them uh, declare their responsibility for what they've done. They don't seem terribly haunted. They don't talk about the awful details, the commanders. The purpose that the executioners do, and I think it's a, there's a reason for it, I think they live their lives, each and every one of them, in manic flight from this pall of guilt and shame that follows them everywhere they go. And most of the time they run up, they're a step ahead of it. They, they, they probably outrun it. But when they stop to sleep at night, it catches up to them and it, it, this, this guilt insinuates itself into their dreams and they have horrible nightmares. And yet because they've never been removed from power, they still have available this victor's history that celebrates what they've done. So they do the human thing. What you and I would also do if we had been incited to betray our individual morality by, uh, by to join a group that's doing something that you know is wrong. And we've all experienced that. We've all been parts of groups that are doing, doing things that we wouldn't personally feel comfortable with. Yet we feel, OK, because it has the blessing of authority or because everybody's doing it, it must be OK. Well, th that's what's happened on a terrible scale with the perpetrators. And then what they, they do, the human thing, which is to take these bitter, rotten memories of atrocity and sugarcoat them in the sweet language of the victor's history so that they can swallow those memories, so they can live with themselves. And that, of course, accounts for why they always talk relentlessly, the executioners, about the most terrible and seemingly detailed, because those are the most bitter memories for them to swallow. And 
and of course, I focused on that because those are the that boasting about these awful details, as I said earlier, is what gives the lie to the whole claim that this could be heroic. So I think that I think in general, the perp I think of the perpetrators as like uh, like the, the like coyote running off the cliff and just running and running and running until. Uh, he's in midair, and what Anwar's what what what's happening in the act of killing when uh, Anwar's watching these successive uh, layers of dramatization in the sort of process of shooting a scene, watching it, shooting a scene, watching it, which you really see in the uncut two and a half hour version of the film that we sh showed here in Australia, that came out here in Australia, what 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 that's like just getting them to look down, and I think Adi's gaze, this humanizing gaze is the same. It's getting them to look down. Question about the connection, yeah, the connection between the question about the connection between the purges and the um, situation with that broken. Did, did I talk about the Goodyear clip in this? No. Already? Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. You're talking all day. I can't remember whether I was talking to you or someone else about. It. I just remember I talked about it. Um, I think that the there's a clip in the Look of Silence that really answers this question. It's a scene where it's an NBC documentary, an American news documentary from 1967, reflecting called Indonesia, the Troubled Victory. And it basically talks about the 1965 killings as a victory for the free world over the communist world, and even though Indonesia was not a communist country. Um, and it talks about, and it celebrates what happened. It talks, it talks about uh, hundreds of thousands of people being killed and rivers choked with bodies, but it also says that Bali, when we hear that Bali is now more beautiful without the communists. And uh, this isn't challenged by the journalist, the presenter of this NBC show. And we also see a, a clip from a very a part of North, very close to where I made these films in North Sumatra on a Goodyear plantation, where we see that Goodyear, one of the world's largest uh, tire companies, is harvesting the latex for our condoms and our tires using slaves drawn from death camps. And this is, of course, what German corporations were doing on the periphery of Auschwitz only 20 years earlier. But Nazi radio was not broadcast before TV. Nazi radio was not broadcasting that to the German people. But American television was broadcasting this use of slave labor taken from death camps that was going to be killed afterwards as a victory for freedom and democracy. This should give all of us pause and lead us to question whether uh, so-called the struggle of the so-called free world against the communist world was the real reason for Western support for the genocide, whether that was really what motivated it, or whether that was rather an excuse, a pretext, perhaps uh, uh, ardently clung to by the American and even Australian policymakers, just as uh, Anwar Congo, you see in the act of killing, clings to lies that he knows are lies to justify what he's done. But perhaps it's an excuse. It's not the real reason for uh, Western participation, but rather an excuse, pretext for murderous corporate plunder. And of course, the occupation of Papua is about the same thing. It's about that copper mine. Freeport Mac, uh, Macmoran mine, and uh, one of the world's largest copper mines, and it is that's the that's that's what that occupation is all about, it, and that's what and, and now there's of course uh, British petroleum and there's forestry interests and there's all sorts of other interests, but that's what that's about, and also, also there's there is research that will soon be published. I don't know if it's still embargoed, but I can vouch for it that Australia supported 
the invasion of East Timor and the occupation of East Timor because they were keen to fix a maritime boundary that the Australia between uh, East Timor and Indonesia, uh, East Timor and Australia, that had been drawn by Australian negotiators in such a way because uh, because the Australians, but not the Indonesians, knew that there was uh, there was there, were, there was a vast oil field on the Australian side, and so that led Australia to cynically support that the invasion, the occupation, and the genocide that occurred there. For what? For $50 billion of oil. 200,000 people died in that occupation. And the Australians knew it and supported it the whole time. Um, um, it's a little bit off topic, but just from a, a, a sort of grammatical point of view, your film is called The Act of Killing and The Look of Silence in English. In Indonesian, you've got Sindagalan and Senya. Um, I was just wondering, what was the, the uh, what was your process in naming those films in Indonesian? Or which did you name first, I suppose? Um, why not the for example? You know, death murder. Just, just an introduction. So, so the, the name in Indonesian is, is Jaga, and that means uh, butcher and slaughter. And the name of the act, the look of silence in Indonesian is Sinyak, which just means silence. Um, the first title that we had was The Look of Silence, actually. We had The Look of Silence because that defines, the, the act of killing for the longest time was called Free Man, which is a great title for the film, only if you've seen the film already. It's not a title that makes you fascinated and makes you want to see the film. So we knew that was just a working title, but we had the title The Look of Silence for a long time because uh, we knew that the Look of Silence defines a kind of project. It defines a poetic work of trying to show what this invisible silence looks like. The uh, Act of Killing as a title was actually designed to mirror The Look of Silence, which I, I was partial to and, and decided would be the title of the second film. And then we tried to find ways of translating The, look, the Act of Killing into Indonesian, but it was hard to get the doubleness of meaning that you have. And so we chose a single word that had that doubleness in it, jaga, uh, which can mean, as I said, both butcher and slaughter. And I think it's nice in a way because, uh, and it's, I don't think it matters which order you see the films. If you haven't seen The Act of Killing, you should see The Look of Silence first. It doesn't matter. If you have, then go to see The Act of Killing, just make sure you see the uncut version of the film, the two hour, the, the same version that showed it mid two years ago and it came out in theaters here. But it doesn't matter which you see first, but it does matter. I think it mattered the, the order of the film's release had much to do with the impact of the film. I think the first film kind of opened this space, demanded that people, in, in its shockingness, in its flamboyance, in its anger, in its anguish, it demanded that people look at this thing, look at what happened, and look at the terrible regime the perpetrators have built. And then the second film comes into that space. Something people, for the most part, if they didn't know it, they suspected it. Something Adis Bukhadri says in the, the Act of Killing, he says, if we succeed in making this film, it will show people what they have always suspected to be true, namely that the government's been lying to everybody and what we did was wrong. And uh, in the expose of corruption and impunity and the role of gangsters in politics, the film also exposes the present day regime. So the act of killing came to Indonesia like the child in the emperor's new clothes, intervening in the cognitive dissonance that allowed people to live knowing that this was true, but unable to talk about it. It forced them to talk about it. The look of silence entered that space and came also like the child in the emperor's new clothes, this time pointing out another thing people had been unable to talk about, the prison of fear in which people knew they were condemned to live, raise their children, and send their children to school to be lied to. And it's, when I say prison of fear, I don't mean that people are trembling all the time. Survivors often are. But I mean that it's a kind of internalized fear. Ariel Herianto, who's a brilliant uh, uh, writer about this very topic, he's based here in Australia, ha has talked about how a regime of fear is most effective when people no longer even realize they're afraid. They just censor themselves. They just know, oh, we probably shouldn't talk about that here. Oh, we shouldn't talk about that with this person. Oh, we shouldn't write about this. Oh, I shouldn't ask about that. And that's fear, too. And of course, when you have lived with that kind of fear, you feel powerless. And the response to that is apathy, because apathy is a way of coping with the shame of powerlessness. So it was very important, the order of the films. And 
I like the title in Indonesian because Jagal means slaughter and Senyap means silence. So of course that mirrors not only it mirrors what happened. There was slaughter and then there was silence, underpinned by fear. Could everyone hear the question? So I, I, I can't speak to survivors as a whole. I can say that I know people would not tell their children what happened because they were afraid of their children inheriting that the stigma. Uh, they wouldn't. They, they knew their children were being taught in schools that the stigma that it was uh, being a, a, a victim or a survivor was something terrible. It was to be stigmatized and to protect their children from that stigma. They wouldn't talk about their own family's history. I know that's changed. Many many people have come up to me and said my parents have opened up to me as a result of these two films about our family's history. But I think I'll answer your question by just speaking very specifically about Adi's family, Rohani would talk about, Adi's mother would talk about uh, Romney's murder, as Adi would put it, morning, noon, and night, like an echo that would never fade in her head. And she hasn't, she didn't want, has not wanted to see the uh, look of silence. In fact, when we, we all met in Thailand to watch the film and discuss whether the film should come out, whether we should, how to release it safely, because I, as I said, couldn't return to Indonesia safely. And we, they watched the film and she didn't want to see it because she understood that Adi would be threatened in the film and she thought that would be very upsetting for her to see. So we actually had to describe the film to her scene by scene. So she, she, she's never seen the film, but she follows very, very closely its release inside Indonesia and abroad. And as Adi's put it, she no longer tells the story morning, noon, and night. She's found, I don't know if it's, I wouldn't say it's necessarily healing, but some comfort in that. <laughs> No, I don't think it's ever too late, but I think that reckon, historical reckoning is about reckon, reckoning with ourselves. I think that, you know, again and again in the, in the Look of Silence, again and again in the Look of Silence, you hear, let the past be past. But survivors always say it out of fear, and perpetrators always say it as a threat, meaning that the past isn't past. It's right there, keeping survivors afraid and empowering perpetrators to threaten. It's an open wound. And the only way that wound will heal is if people find the courage to address it, to acknowledge it, to tend to it. And um, William Faulkner said this very beautifully when he said, ironically, uh, not ironically, importantly, in, in terms of what I'm about to say, uh, an American Southern writer said, the past is not dead, it is not even past, it's always with us. And not, not just because it sort of uh, follows us, it's because it is us, we are us. Past. The fact that we're all here in, I don't, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of the people whose land we're on, but um, we're on, on, we're in someone's land. Well, the fact that I'm in someone's land whose name I don't even know, and we're speaking English, is a consequence of our past. It is us. It makes us who we are. And all we can do, what we must do, is stop. Find the courage to stop looking forward. Our politicians will always say we have to look forward, we have to look forward, we have to get on with things. But we have to also find the courage to stop, to stand still, to turn 180 degrees around, to look backwards, and to accept, not in the sense of making excuses, 
but to really accept so that we can turn back around and then move forward together, caring for one another in a way that was impossible before we found the courage to look backwards and move forwards in knowing each other and ourselves really for the first time. And if the look of silence, and I'm released, I just came from the United States where we released the look of silence in theaters at the end of a year where uh, my country has been reminded in terrible and important ways again and again about the open wound of race, which is hundreds of years old. Uh, and indeed, in parts of the country, apartheid is only a few years old. But, or a few decades old, and economic apartheid persists. But one never, it never becomes too late because the past is always with us. The Armenian genocide is a hundred years old, and it's still an open wound. And we, I think somehow, if there's an urgency, it's not because we have to do it before it's too late. It's because so long as it's not done, generation after generation finds their lives wrecked by fear. You cannot have uh, democracy without community. And you cannot have community when people are afraid of each other. I think the film, The Look of Silence, is, is I said it's a kind of poem. And it's a kind of poem. If the act of killing is a kind of nonfiction fever dream. I don't even think it's a documentary. It's a kind of fever dream. But The Look of Silence is a poem. And it's a poem composed in memoriam not to the dead, not to the dead who were killed in 1965, but to, it's composed in memoriam to all that's been destroyed, the lives broken by 50 years of fear, lives that can never be made whole again, because whatever truth, whatever reconciliation, whatever justice might come in the future, it is indeed too late for Adi's father, he said. And so we need to, that's why it's urgent, because too many people's lives have been diminished by fear. Um, hi there. Just to sort of feed off that earlier question you sort of said, um, when we look at the, like, the Nazis and the Holocaust, we had the Nuremberg trials, and I know that's a really like, sort of really good news, and they had reconciliation, and I'm sure as we said, with Argentina and things like that. The events in 1965 were 50 years ago. Do you think if there isn't this sort of formal process of examining within Indonesia before both the perpetrators and the victims die, will this have a part of the Because it, it won't have that directness with the people who are involved. I, I suppose I I suppose I think that it would have a very different moral meaning. And maybe, maybe that's also maybe, maybe there's that sense also in which you were right in your question that that there's also an urgency because it would mean so much for the families that can remember these events firsthand to have that to have that acknowledgement and that closure, and then so much for their children. This, this will this will have to be the last question. Yeah, I think I'll talk about the last two scenes. You're talking about the last two big confrontations in the film. In the second to last one, Adi goes and visits a perpetrator who, since I filmed him in 2005, has become hard of hearing. And his daughter is now living with him. Since when I arrived, his daughter is living with him and looking after him. 
She says that he's senile, but we can see that he's not senile. He remembers not only what he did very well, but he's also keeping track of the time and saying, your children need to go to the mosque, they have an appointment. And so he's clearly not senile. But he is hard of hearing and he's mid and frail and she's looking after him. And uh, she says, that because he's lost his hearing, or his hearing so much worse than it was when you were here last time, I should sit with him and make sure he understands the questions. And so she does, and he starts boastfully telling me the same things and telling Adi the same things that he told me years earlier. Really awful things. He talks about, well, the scene begins with, because she's part of the scene, and I didn't have any old footage with which to introduce her, I asked her what she knew about her father to understand where she was as he started. And um, she says, I think it was me asking the question, not Adi. And she says, well, I, I knew, I've known my father was killing people since uh, I was in junior high school. And I said, how did that make you feel? And she says, proud. I was proud because he was a hero. And, and he was, and she doesn't just say extra, killing, just exterminating uh, communists. And then uh, that's how it begins. And then her father starts telling what he did. And he tells some horrible things that she'd never known, that he would bring, he brought a Chinese person's head to a coffee shop frequented by Chinese people just to scare them. And that he drank the blood of his victims to prevent himself from going crazy. And you see, although he's talking, you see her, she's the one in focus in the shot, and you see her face collapse as she's realizing that her father is not the man she hoped him to be, or at least the man she tried to convince herself that he was, because Probably, she's a gentle and sensitive woman, she probably never really did think that it was heroic. But she tried to make herself believe that so she could live with the situation of being his daughter. And she starts suddenly realizing, I guess, that she'll have to spend the rest of his life looking after a man who now, in a terrible way, has become a stranger to her. And instead of doing what I would do, I think, in such a situation, which is to panic and kick the crew out of the house, she becomes very still and very quiet, and listens, I think, to her conscience, and apologizes to Adi, unnecessarily, because she didn't do anything wrong. If anyone had to apologize, it was us for coming in and upsetting her in this way. And Adi, having had her reach across this abyss that all the other confrontations have kind of uh, approached, but never been able to cross, Adi has to then forgive, and he, he, he says it's not your fault, and he hugs her, but he also fought, he also hugs her father. And um, it was this very, it was one of the most beautiful and delicate things I've seen. I don't, the next scene is a very special case in terms of behind, behind and I know Adi, one more thing, Adi and she have remained close and in touch to this day. Uh, the next scene was a very special case, I said earlier that I had only spent, these men that I filmed from 2003 to 2005, I'd only spent, you know, uh, one or two days or three days with them. I was just working my way swiftly up the chain of command. That's not true with that final family visit. The final confrontation is not with a perpetrator, but with his, it's a meeting between Adi and the perpetrator's widow and his two sons, and the perpetrator's two sons. And I had spent three months with that family. Uh, dramatizing in the way that Anwar Congo would do later with his friends, dramatizing what the perpetrator had done, what Amir Hassan, the father, had done. And so it never occurred to me that the wife and two sons both participated, spent three months with me, that they would deny knowing what happened, what the father had done. It never occurred to me because if they did that, I would know that they're lying. But because I, and the plan was that Adi would go and say, look, I know who you are. You know who I am. I'm Ramli's brother. And it's not your fault what Amir Hassan, your father, your husband did. And we have to live together. What if one day my daughter would want to marry one of your sons? Wouldn't it be terrible if we couldn't come together for them as a family? How shall we live together? But because they panicked, uh, I think they panicked because I came after knowing, uh, because I came back suddenly with Romney's brother. Because they panicked, uh, they lied. They pretended they didn't know anything about what the father had done. And I start pushing them to look at this old footage from 2004, not in order to, um, not to humiliate them, not to punish them, but simply trying to get past this denial so that we would be able to have 
the discussion for which we come, so that Adi could have that discussion. I thought this was his best chance for reconciliation. We had, in fact, not yet shot the scene with the daughter, uh, the, the, the one that came just before, the, the one that I just described before. So I thought this was his best chance, and I was pushing, trying to get past that denial. And we failed. And I don't think the mother actually in that scene is, is apologizing I, sincerely. I think she's trying to get us out of the house. And she's all apologizing, glancing over to me, glancing over to Adi, glancing to her sons, trying to see if this got them off the hook. Now, a perpetrator, and maybe even a son of a perpetrator who's been raised in such a sort of a follow in his father's footsteps, might not even be able to say, even to go through, might not be able to even go through the motion of saying I'm sorry, because it would be too threatening emotionally, too painful. But she never killed anybody, and she is able to do it, but I don't think it's sincere. And I left that scene feeling terrible because I I liked that family. I hoped that we would be building bridges, not burning them. And I realized that we totally failed. Now, to come back to your question about hope, I or what your comment about hope, I uh, thought we had nothing from that final scene. And when I looked at the rushes, the material, I thought, no, this scene shows more palpably than any other how everybody is afraid of each other, and how impossible community is. And I ended this film with that scene because to end it with the previous scene that I described with the daughter apologizing would be dishonest. It would give you the feeling that somehow uh, the abyss was being bridged. And it's not. And that what has given this film, made, lent this film whatever impact they have in Indonesia, whatever it has in Indonesia, what's given this film that impact is the fact that viewers come away forced to acknowledge this uh, fear and guilt that's dividing everybody. And if I'd ended the other way, it would have been a false hope. It would have been dishonest. I'll just close by saying that's not really, though, even that confrontation is not really, though, the end of the film. Because there's an epilogue where you see the scene where Adi's father's crawling, you see Ruk Kamat, one of the survivors who managed to escape because Ramit had panicked and run away on the way to be killed. He comes and visits Adi's mother. Adi's mother cries when she, as soon as she opens the door and sees it's Kamat. And it's the first time she's cried since 1967. She said that to us afterwards. And then we see kind of epilogue where I think the film ends with the two things that I hope that I think every well-lived life should end with. And that's, uh, two, I hope that you, each and every one of our lives here will end with these two things. And that's with death, but also with love. Well, on that note, I, I hope you can join me in uh, thanking you.